Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Survivor Org Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Connors. Sadly, Dennis Patrick, my wonderful co-host, is out fighting crime under the name El Chupacabra, so he can't be there right now. But we do have Jillian Larson from Survivor Gabon. Say hello, Jillian. Hey, everybody. This is Jillian from Survivor Gabon. It's great to be here, and thanks, Colin, for having me on board. No problem. Thank you so much for coming. So let's get started. Right off the bat, what was your strategy entering Survivor Gabon? Um, I'd always said two things. One was that I really couldn't have a strategy until I got there and I knew who my tribe mates were. Because strategies, well, in my mind, I thought they would possibly change, which is actually what happened. Uh, depending on who you ended up with and how those personalities were and how they blended with your own personality. Um, and otherwise, generally, I was going to go in with a, a strategy of what I called strategic mediocrity. I was planning on not being too much of anything. I didn't want to be strong. I didn't want to be weak. I didn't want to be loud or noisy or, or soft and quiet or too interactive or, or, you know, no interaction. So it was basically going to be strategic mediocrity, which of course nobody saw on my edit. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a, the Sandra strategy basically from Pearl Islands. Uh, pretty much, except, uh, you know, they showed her as being much quieter and behind the scenes, and that's why everybody thought she was riding coattails, which she was not. Uh, mine, they edited me as being this happy, loud, we can do it, guys, let's do it, you know, and on and on and on, instead of the times that I was just sitting around quietly doing what I was doing, uh, which is fine. That, that's the, what we give permission for, you know, you can do what you please with us. Uh, Were you happy with your edit? Um, not really, uh, for many reasons. One is that uh, I'm not always loud and enthusiastic. Yes, I certainly am a lot of the time, um, but that was what it showed. The second part of it was that um, everybody who knows me, who saw the show, said, What? <laughs> it didn't show you like you are at all. Were you really this different when you were on Survivor, or is it just what they're showing? And thirdly, the part that I actually was sorry they didn't show, and of course it fits into the survivor editing story, is that in my tribe I was doing stuff. I was chopping the wood and I was knocking down termite mounds, looking for termites to add to the rice. I was looking for worms. I made fishing line. I made furniture out of elephant bones. Um, I brought in a whole carcass and did all kinds of stuff with it. Um, I tried to make fire and endlessly with no result. Uh -huh. I how to do that five different ways. And because I was a quick boot, they didn't show any of that that was that I was actually doing survival skills. I made a torch out of resin on a fork stick with a piece of uh, broken crockery so that we'd have a light to walk around with at night. Um, so I did a lot of that sort of stuff which wasn't shown. So it made me look like I matched what Randy said about me being a useless old woman. Oh, uh, uh, wow. I, yeah, I had no idea. I had no yeah. idea you did so much. Yeah, that was that was, to me was the saddest part. Yeah, they showed me as being happy and enthusiastic, which I am. That's fine. Um, but Bob, on the other hand, and I'm very glad that he got the edit he did, was shown, you know, rebuilding the hut and making all kinds of things. He was making furniture out of wood, and I was making it out of elephant bones. Um, and, of course, he went further, so it, it showed him doing all of these things, which was great. I'm very happy for Bob that he got that. Uh, so that was the worst part of my edit that I just didn't really like. I thought, gosh, they, well, of course, it wouldn't have fitted into Randy's comment, being a useless old woman. You can't say that in what we do these unique type of things that I was doing. Uh-huh. Um, right off the bat, you were in charge of picking people for your tribe. What motivated you to pick a crystal? That's a very good reason, actually, and it looked like it was a very stupid pick. Um, I do a lot of things fairly well. I mean, I was 61 at the time when I went into the game. I've always been very athletic and, you know, competent in a lot of different things. I can swim like a fish. I can hold my water under, you know, under my breath underwater. I can balance. I can do puzzles. I can do all of that stuff, but I don't run very well. Um, I, you know, I've never been a a runner. I've played field hockey and tennis and sports, but not track. Um, actually, didn't have track 
South Africa, so I was never a track runner. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had found Crystal on a spoiler site. I went to the two-week interview and saw the big four, six foot three woman, and thought, dear God, you know, I wonder what she does. Um, and then I found, I went on to the spoiler, or I was kept looking to see if I could find out who was actually going to be picked by spoilers. And somebody said, there's an Olympic gold medal runner, um, and they said a strong old woman. So I thought, well, maybe I'm a strong old woman. <laughs> And uh, Olympic gold medal runner, and then one of the sites is said by the name of Crystal Cox. I googled her, saw her picture, and I said, "Yeah, that's her." So I had studied her, you know, her and everybody else while we were in casting uh, picking time. And then when we were there, before we went into the game, I again studied everybody to kind of decide who. I absolutely knew when I saw Bob had been chosen to go that he and I would do a schoolyard pick because I'm South African, I know African culture, and I knew I could have written the script for Jeff, actually, uh, with the oldest, two oldest people, please step forward and start the pick. But we're in Africa, and Africa reveres their elders. I knew exactly what was going to happen. And when he started that script, I said, aha, I knew it. <laughs> uh, so I had decided during those the time, knowing Crystal was the gold medal runner, um, that I thought that it was a good possibility I would pick her because I needed a counterpart to my weakness. Um, so I thought maybe she can't swim, which actually I don't know if she can. Mm -hmm. um, so I could do the things that I thought maybe she wasn't good at, and she could be the runner. Uh, otherwise, it was going to be the cute part, which was not. Uh, and then when we went into the game, Jeff just, you know, explained the first challenge, which was, running from here and running to there and down this little hill and then up this enormous hill which looked so much less steep than it actually was and outside picked the steeper side unfortunately um, and uh, uh, so that was why I picked her but then I said okay is it, is it the cute guy or is it the runner and when he described this and I actually also have found on a site where the game was going to be. There was the whole challenge field was described and I thought, boy, I'm screwed. <laughs> all land-based challenges. It's none, nothing in water. Um, so I thought, I've just got to pick that runner woman. Mm -hmm. And I was by a picker. And just quickly I'll add that I actually beat her in the first challenge, in that running challenge. You beat Crystal at the running challenge at the beginning? I did, but I will add that, that Several of us needed a lot of help up there. Maddie and Dan, particularly, did a lot of pushing and shoving and pulling. Um, and I actually thought I was lost because I was so focused on the ground, pushing myself uh -huh. up. It was literally, I don't know, like an 80 degree uh, steep hill. Um, so I was so busy pulling and grabbing, you know, little rocks and grass to pull myself up and being shoved by Maddie from behind. Um, and Susie and Crystal and myself all seemed to need help according to what I saw on the um, show. Um, and I got up, I beat her. And uh, she was just thinking, give up, that old woman beat me. Well, uh, part of it. We got a question from actually Dennis Patrick, the producer that can't be here right now. And he wants to know, how much did your background of coming from South Africa help you? Um, I don't know that it helped me much. I think where it helped me was in my being chosen for that season. Um, I have a very African soul, actually. I was I had a wonderful uh, African woman who was my nanny growing up, and she instilled in me this love of African culture and Africa altogether. So I think that played a part in me being chosen for the born Africa, um, because I have this whole spirit of Ubuntu, which is treat others as you want to be treated yourself, and none of us would be anything without each other, um, and etc. Actually, in the game where it's the only thing that it really, it's, I was screwed because it was Africa. I mean, I just knew it, you're, you're screwed, this isn't going to work out for you, because you're so much better in water than, and I knew how to find mussels on rocks in the ocean and fish and, you know, dive for fish for the, for the Australian sling and stuff. Um, so that was a drawback to me being in Africa and the only part that was a, a, a thing that helped was that I know wildlife I've lived amongst it, I've been you know, camping with hippos walking past the tent and lions roaring, you know, half a mile away and stuff, so it doesn't scare me because I'm very careful I understand wildlife I respect it, and I didn't care that I could hear elephants 
fairly near and monkey chattering somewhere near. And I think a lot of my classmates, I think if you look in the air, I, was, I was sleeping in the door because there was no room left inside. And according to Dan and them, they were thinking, oh, my God, you know, oh, listen to that. Ooh, ooh. So they were all kind of scared, whereas I wasn't. So that was the part that was in my favor. But otherwise, um, it was it wasn't the best season for me to be on because of the land-based challenges, but I was so thrilled. I don't know if you know what you probably do, and your listeners may as well, um, that I tried eight years to get on. So I wasn't going to say, oh, I think I'll wait for an ocean one day. <laughs> You'll wait till Survivor or South Pacific. No, you wanted yeah. to get on right then. Right, right. But, you know, I absolutely, Colin, I believe the whole thing was a destined path. I had to do this for eight years to get on because it built a story which I use in motivational speaking about persistence, dealing with disappointment, belief in yourself, etc. And then I had to be in an area that I was not going to shine and be good in because I needed to be booted because mm-hmm. that's when I created Reality Rally. So I, I do, I, you know, I don't know if I'm just, you know, telling myself to make myself feel better, but I honestly believe it was meant to be. Well, I mean, everything in what you've done with the charity has helped out, you know, a great ton of people. So it's hard to argue that the chain of events wasn't needed. Yeah, absolutely. I do believe, you know, I was offered a place on Amazing Race in year four of applying, and I turned it down. Um, I was also offered a place in four pilot shows that somebody was producing um, up in L.A., and I turned them down because I totally felt driven to Survivor, and I honestly believe it was for the path that I followed with Survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, what made you want to do Survivor, though? That I really couldn't explain either, because the first show that I watched was, you know, Richard Hatch's uh, season of Borneo. Mm-hmm. Um, I caught it as it was like in the middle of it, because I'd been traveling in South Africa visiting family, and I came back to the quarters, and... Uh, I just was bitten by the bug of survivor. I looked, first of all, I said to my husband, oh my God, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Just like, <laughs> that, that, that. And then they did a challenge, and the challenge is what hooked me. And I looked at him, first of all, I said, boy, that's the dumbest show I've ever seen. And then I said, oh my God, I'm going to do that show one day. And that's when my journey to survivor began. Um, I just had, I mean, I honestly feel like that was also part of this whole destined path. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, you know, eight years of trying to get on a show, and I know many, many people out there do. I don't know why I was doing it. I just couldn't explain it. Um, But I felt driven to get on Survivor, and obviously I did. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, let's bring the focus back to more of what happened while you were out there. What was Michelle like? Did she fit her at it? Um, no, Michelle was miserable. She was miserable, you know, she had hardly any clothes, and as, you know, we don't go in with many clothes, but she had teeny little shorts on and a little top, and she's a skinny girl, so she had no fat to keep her warm. Um, she was miserable. She just was, you know, withdrawn and isolative, and I think part of it was her skin was breaking out, and she wasn't liking the camera being so close to her because of her, you know, how she was looking, and she was miserable, um, and a real negative influence on the tribe, um, so she was just miserable, okay. and so for her sake, I'm glad she got out, otherwise it would have been a, she would have been, it would have been a huge problem for her. Mm-hmm. Um, later on, GC would become the leader of your tribe. Were you really okay with that, or did you just play along? <laughs> that was ridiculous. I mean, first of all, you know, Jeff's favorite game is leader, leader, who wants to play leader? I mean, that's like, oh, God, where are you going to get this one going in this tribe? Um, that was so ridiculous. Our tribe would not have had a leader. Nobody wanted to be led. Everybody was doing their own thing. And, you know, GC was far from a leader, and it was really ridiculous. Uh, so we all kind of nodded and said, well, yeah, somebody's got to be leader to please Jeff. You know, go ahead, GC, you can be leader. Um, and then it was so stupid that I shouldn't use these words. This is a family-friendly show, I'm sure. Uh, you know, it's so, you know, it's a brief. So the next day, it's like, okay, so GC's the leader. All right, so let's tell the leader that what we think we should do is blah, blah, blah. So then the leader would say, okay, everybody. Uh, Randy says, or Jillian says, or Susie says, let's do such and such. Well, it was so dumb. 
<laughs> yeah, it sounds like he didn't lead at all. You guys just kind of made him feel like the leader. He didn't even do anything. I mean, you know, so what? He, he gave it up the next day. Mm -hmm. and the next council is like, I don't want to be leader anymore. Well, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you lost that second immunity challenge, did you know you were going to be voted out? Um, it was a very good chance that I would. I kept hearing Crystal, like, sort of snuck around listening behind the hut and stuff to what was being said uh, while I was looking for hidden idols, um, you know, and, and listened and watched and saw. And she kept saying, and she was very tight with Kenny and GC and Susie, I thought, um, and several, and there seemed to be a majority. And Maddie was kind of like the sort of out there, like the cool sort of dude. Uh -huh. um, and it was clear that I was very probably next on the block because I hadn't really shown my, as I was trying to do with that strategic mediocrity stuff. Um, however, Susie and I got talking that morning. We were collecting. She and I did most of the work. I mean, she was great. She did a lot of work, and I don't think she got the edit she deserved either because she really did do a lot around and made things happen with us. A lot of the work stuff. Um, and so she and I got talking and said, God, there's such sick of all the negative stuff that keeps happening and we're losing and the park up on the stride but grumpy and negative and everything sucks and they don't want to play this and blah, blah. So we said, okay, why don't we, you know, let's see what we can get a majority here and vote either Kenny, who was the weakest, mm -hmm. or he thought Crystal because she was, she felt she was sort of a negative influence for the tribe. Um, so Dan, Maddie, Susie and myself, were saying to vote for one of those and we would decide who. So we talked to Dan, I mean, we talked to uh, Dan and he, I did, he was on board. We talked to Maddie, Susie talked to Maddie, he was on board and then we tried to talk to Randy. And Randy says, oh, I'm not ready to talk about anything like that. So, yeah, I'm too early. I said, I don't know what you mean, too early. <laughs> it's not too early for me and you know what, they're gonna, these younger people on the stripe are gonna lock the three of us, older people, off one after the other. Um, no, nope, don't want to talk about it. Um, which he says today, I mean, I see Randy quite often in different functions we go to. He says, I didn't even hear you say that. And I said, yeah, you should have listened. Um, and uh, so he just wouldn't commit, so we couldn't get a majority. So Susie and Dan both said to me, um, you know, we just got to go with the majority because they don't want to put the target on their back. And I said, hey, go for it. you know, whatever. Whatever's yeah. meant to, she's meant to be, I can't swing it, so just do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so it does seem like you had a lot of knowledge that you would be going, but let's uh, shift gears to some fun questions. Can okay. you do any celebrity impress impressions? <laughs> you mean a survivor celebrity or others? Any celebrity. James Miller did the best John Wayne I have ever heard, and I want someone to do a better celebrity impression than him. Oh, dear God. I should have prepared you for that. I could have practiced it in a mirror. <laughs> Well, that's the fun of the question, is it comes out of nowhere. Oh, it certainly has come out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I can't think of one. Because, you know, my accent gets in the way. Uh -huh. uh, well, actually, all right, I can do a celebrity impression. I'll probably do a South African one because that's where my accent comes in. But then, of course, nobody will know what it is. Uh, um, all right, I'll, I'll impersonate. Uh, well, I do an impression of Ernie Elf. Do you know who that is? No. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's a golfer. And okay. he, he talks just like a South African, and he's just thrilled to be here playing in this tournament, and he's going to really take this one. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have done a woman because it's obviously not a man's voice. No, I'm <laughs> not good at impressions, so I failed that one. All right. Thanks. Well, for the next interview, you'll uh, practice, okay? I will. Absolutely. Okay. I will practice. One, and I'll do a woman. Okay. What's your favorite Survivor season? Wow. Um, interestingly enough, I like Redemption Island, although most people didn't. Yeah, why do you like Redemption Island? Well, for two reasons. One is I, I do think that I put that idea into Survivor's head, into CBS's head, or Mark Burnett, or John Kirkhoff, or somebody, or Jeff, or whatever. Because in my boot interview, which I've actually found on CBS, but now I can't find it again, um, I talked about, hey, I'm in Africa, and I believe that the gods of Africa, or the spirits of Africa, are going to look after me, and they're going to tuck me away somewhere, 
I'm not really going home now. I'm going to put away somewhere, and then they're going to bring me back as a huge surprise, and I'm going to say, ta-da, here I am, and I'll have <laughs> another chance to get in. Uh, so I actually have to find that interview again because I want to look at it. Um, so I kind of, you know, I, I was hoping that was going to happen. Well, it didn't. Uh, but I, I joke that they saw that interview, which they do, and said, ah, oh, now that's the thought. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I did like the opportunity for somebody to possibly get back in with revenge, which was clearly what most of them were doing, um, and Christine's determination to beat everybody to get back in. I loved that determined, you know, determined spirit and stuff. So I actually liked Redemption Island. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Well, um, who's your favorite player of all time? Well, of course, Richard's one of mine because it was the first one. They all hadn't a clue what this whole thing was about. They didn't know. They hadn't formed all these bar alliances where everybody knows everybody from, you know, hanging out in the bars with each other, um, you know, and at, at events and everything. Because there's no pure survivor anymore. Everybody knows everybody. Um, and they, they didn't know anything. And he performed the path for... You know what Survivor could be and would be like. I think that he was uh, the season savior. Of course, the last snake and rat talk also helped um, <laughs> keep it going. But uh, yeah, I would say Richard, and uh, he's also still one of my po- favorite post Survivor people uh, because he is awesome. He does so much for charity. He's so willing to lend his face. In fact, he's on our promotional material. Um, he's so willing to do stuff for charity. I just love that spirit in him. Speaking of charity, let's get right into it. I heard you have a charity. Well, I don't actually have the charity. I have a charity event. I raise money for our local, one of our local charities. Yes, I do. It's called Reality Rally, and I'd love to share with everybody out there what we do. Exactly. Let's go for it. Reality Rally. Okay, so after I was booted from Survivor, um, I don't know, most people probably know that you don't go home. You stay there, some way secluded, away from everybody, with nothing. I mean, we had no TV, Internet, radio, communication with home, anything. Uh, we didn't have a DVD player with a sheet on the wall so we could watch movies at night. Uh, but otherwise, basically books and entertain yourself. So I was training for a 60-mile walk. Um, that I was going to be doing when I came back. So I started walking in the jungle every day for five hours. Because what an opportunity to walk in a jungle or an endless beach um, for five weeks. So that's what I started doing. And Reality Rally just came to my head. I realized that I was now able to do something with... I never even looked at it as being a survivor celebrity because I didn't realize that all of that that went with it. I was so just determined to get on this game. But now I recognized that I was going to be part of a reality family. And I could use that, and not in a negative way, for a benefit of some kind. Um, That was what I'd been driven for eight years to do, and this is where it was leading. So I also love my town of Temecula. It's the most amazing um, charity-minded, community-minded town that's just awesome. I said, I've got to do something to pull together our community, not to pull together because it's already pulled together, but to add to, enhance our our town, bring focus to our town, and um, have celebrities from Survivor and all these other shows that are out there come to Temecula to raise money. So Reality Rally is a seed that was planted in my heart after I was booted, and as I say, as my flame of Survivor was snuffed out, the flame of Reality Rally was ignited, and it's taken off like a bonfire. It's just been like a wildfire. It's awesome. Um, it's a three-day event of fun for funds for Michelle's place, which is a breast cancer resource center in Temecula. And Michelle died at 26 after being misdiagnosed at 19 with a breast lump. And I looked at that and I thought, my God, there for the grace of God for me. Um, and there are thousands of people. I believe it's one in eight women that will get breast cancer. Um, and the statistics are really, there were 4,000 people who died this year in California alone of breast cancer, and many of them under 30. I knew that Jen Lyon, who was a survivor contestant, um, had also had breast cancer. And so I wanted to do something in tribute and honor of those two women and to raise funds for Michelle's place. Her parents set up the center 11 years ago to provide support to those fighting that battle. So I came back with this huge idea all written down. Um, I actually blew out my shoulder body 
surfing while I was in Gabon and required two major reconstructive surgeries. So I knew I couldn't do anything for about a year and a half. So I did the groundwork. I connected with reality stars. I got to be known as somebody other than just the annoying, useless old woman. <laughs> um, let people know who I was and what I was going to be doing. Um, so we have, we bring, this will be our third year we're going into in next April, it's April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Mm -hmm. We bring in the distant reality stars on the 4th. Um, the reality stars themselves are required to raise a minimum of $400 for the charity because I want to keep it in the forefront of everybody's mind that we don't pay these reality stars and they come, we bring over a hundred and they're from about 30 different shows because everybody's got a following, not just Survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want people to know that these, we do not pay them to come, but we cover expenses um, for them, which a lot of it is sponsored in kind. However, it's not just a huge, fun, great, awesome party, which it is for them and for the public who come, and we draw people from across the country to come and be part of it. Um, but it's a fundraising event. So the Reality Stars hopped on board and raised money last year, and we're doing it again. So we draw money in from across the world, actually, because a lot of people can't come to Temecula for the actual event. But they can be part of it by donating to one of the reality stars on our website through a donate button. It's very easy to do. Um, and we brought money in from 11 countries and every one of the 50 states this last April. And I'm encouraging people to do the same because every single dollar mounts up and counts. And I feel it's a very powerful thought that who knows which dollar is the one that provided and added to that money to for a mammogram for somebody that saved their life. So our fun weekend is for the public, um, for our sponsors, for our volunteers. We have over 400 volunteers. I have over 600 people that help make it happen. And well over 100 reality stars, uh, as I said, from 30 different shows. Um, to highlight what those shows are as well, to promote what Temecula is, and to be fun, we have a golf tournament on the Friday. We have a wonderful party at a winery that's sponsored by Wilson Creek Winery in Temecula on Friday. We visit Michelle's place so that everybody can, the reality stars can feel our charity, can meet Michelle's parents, and can see what the services provide to do for everybody. Um, and that, uh, on our website, on the home page, I encourage everybody to go to realityrally.com and click on, there's a picture of a, a gentleman, and it's Michelle's father, and it's the story of why Michelle's place started. Um, and then Saturday is fun. We have autograph signing for about two hours uh, in a, a, a program with uh, pictures that they find, and all our sponsors are highlighted in that. Um, and then we have an amazing race kind of game throughout Old Town Temecula. And those videos are all on our website as well under video highlights. And you've got to see it to see how fun it is. Teams of three public are paired up with a reality star. And they go to 13 challenge checkpoints throughout Old Town Temecula. That's like a little old west town. Uh -huh. And they things like an amazing race. I'm not like huge, but we had a zip line by one adventure company. The high school is put on challenge. The theater, you have to get on the stage and perform. Uh, you have to make a movie with movie industry. The gunfighters, you have to dress in costume and then shoot and lasso and, <laughs> and, and uh, then move on. So you have to do this challenge as a team and then move to the next one. And then, the, you know, the team that gets in obviously wins. But we're changing it a little this year to make it more of an experience than an actual race. Because it's not a race, it's an experience. Um, and then Saturday night we have a great red carpet extravaganza celebration party uh, with a red carpet just like they have in Hollywood um, with all the reality stars on. And not only are the reality stars able to raise money for our charity, but they get together like a family reunion at these charity events and have such a good time together, uh, meet up with old friends and make new ones, and also then extend their 15 minutes of fame and show that they're also charity-minded and are here to do something good. Um, and then Sunday's a low-key breakfast, and then we say bye-bye, and uh, everybody goes and has a nap mm -hmm. uh, because it's huge. And, yes. uh yeah, huge and so worthwhile and such fun. Well, that sounds like an amazing, amazingly good time. And I actually 
know that some of the Survivor Org players, we're going to try to get together and come down there in April. And I'm super excited about that. Yeah, people that love Survivor so much, we play it online. We're going to try to get a group to go down there. But also, for all the listeners out there, please visit realityrally.com and donate. Yeah, check and see who you want to donate to. Who would you like to see win this uh, fundraising challenge? Um, and all you have to do is go on to realityrally.com 2013 star lineup. And the list of people, the, the people that are on there are committed to coming. I don't put anybody on there until they've sent me what I need, their bio, their commitment, their form with their information. So those ones are committed to coming. Obviously, if something comes up, like they put on another survivor season or, you know, kill the family or something, then I certainly don't you know, drop out. But then yes. I pull them off. Um, so everybody that's on there is really raising money. So click on that little star that says donate to so and so to help them raise the most. Mm-hmm. It's not going to the charity. It's not going to the star. It's going through the star um, so that somebody has the bragging rights to raise more money than anybody else. <laughs> and that person will be the sole winner of Reality Rally. Well, well the fundraising part of it. And I'll, yes. I'll you know, we also have dogs. I don't know if you've seen on the website, but a lot of people don't care about human reality stars. So we bring, there's an organization down in San Diego area called the Southern California Surf Dogs. And these dogs are just awesome. In fact, I was surfing on a surfboard with two dogs dressed in a reality rally pink gnome suit. And I <laughs> two gray wigs on the uh, the two dogs I was surfing with to advertise Reality Rally in this competition and I actually came third so it was pretty fun but we bring these dogs and um, to be a highlight for people that care about dogs and want to do something through the dogs for charity and our dog Ricochet well not our dog but the dog that one of the dogs is the Reality Rally spokes dog and that dog raises the most every year um <laughs> She raised 8000 the first year, and she raised 5000 this year. And this dog altogether has raised over 150000 for a variety of charities over the last three years. So my challenge this year is human stars out there. Are you going to let the dog eat? And I myself raised, I don't know, maybe 1400 1500 bucks because I will not ask people to do something that I won't do myself. Mm-hmm. So I, I came fourth in the competition. There were several of these me, which was awesome. I loved that. Um, but yeah, I don't want, I, well, I'd love the dog to be this again. That's a lot of the money from Michelle's place. However, <laughs> I, human star to step up and take the, the position of top fundraiser. <laughs> Come on, humans. This is shenanigans. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it, guys. Go donate to somebody or pick somebody. Go pick Richard <laughs> H. You know, he's on there. Got a button. Go donate to yeah. him. He has thumbs. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Go donate to somebody. You can be part of Reality Rally through donations. So do it, please. Yes. Do it. We will have links to all of this information on the website and on the Facebook. We're going to Twitter it, and then we're going to bring it all back again when it gets closer to the date. Uh, Jillian, is there anything you would like to end with? I don't think so. I just want to thank all those Survivor fans out there and reality sh- show fans in general. But it's uh, it's the fans that keep these shows going. Yes, sponsorships do, and they make the money for the web, you know the the networks to keep going. But if the fans weren't watching, and I'm a fan, if the fans were not watching these shows and being a big part of you know all the Survivor games that are played out there, the Big Brother games, the you know Amazing Race. I don't think it has as many games out there with people. But thank you, fans. You are the people out there that keep reality um, shows in the forefront. Without you, it would not be where it is. So thank you, fans. I appreciate all the support. And, uh, yeah, it's awesome. And thank you so much, guys, for listening. And thank you so much, Jillian, for coming on. I know we're going to bring you on again around April if you're available. Great. Right. And in fact, you know what would be awesome is uh, towards the, I think, uh, I've got to look at the date, but the end of February is when our fundraising competition ends for the reality stars um, to see who's top. The, the fundraising will continue through the event in April, but the competition for who's top fundraiser is at the end of February so well maybe I've got it for March 10th of March I've got to look maybe it's the 10th of March um, 
So it would be great if we could do one last push for everybody. And oh, then yeah. we could tell you who's winning, mm -hmm. um, who's getting the most. Cool, cool. Thank you again so much for coming on. And thank you so much.